We are back on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. The three of us back in the house. Shock, Arch, Rack. Have we gone along enough to, to where we can use nicknames and you guys know who we're talking about? Hope so. If not, if it's your first time watching, Derek Rackley, Dave Archer, DJ Shockley. It's a thing in football, right? Everybody ends up with a nickname. Yeah. Our producer was in here telling us a story from the locker room, and he was talking about Zoe, right? Yeah, so sure. if you just if, if you're for around sure. the game long enough, we find ways to shorten your name. Well, and let me throw a caveat in on that. You don't get to pick your own nickname, okay? <laughs> if you do, that never really works out very well for you. I so mean, we're usually your, te- your teammates will pick your teammate your, your nickname out, and sometimes it's something you don't like, <laughs> we- you know. We, we literally were at the game on Sunday, and Rack and I are about to do a halftime hit, and this guy comes up and says, Rack Dog, hey, I love you guys. You guys do a great job talking about the podcast. So there guess you what? go. Thanksgiving. It's hey, awesome. To your point, the one, the nickname that you may not like, when I was playing for the Falcons, there was a gentleman in the building. I will leave him nameless. <laughs> but he ended up getting a nickname of Chunky But Funky. <laughs> so probably not one of those nicknames that you necessarily Chunky, pick for yourself. You yeah. may not like it. But that's what happens hey, that's in an NFL happens. locker room sometimes. There you go. All right, so let's get through what we are going to talk about today. Our game MVPs, the Falcons' victory Ooh. over the Texans. We'll Ooh. break down the matchup <laughs> all that we can in this matter of a short time in the podcast. Uh, we'll talk about Desmond Ritter. Came under fire for his performance early on in the season, but he was able to flip the script last weekend. Ah. And then we will move forward, talk a little bit about the Commanders' matchup this weekend. So, guys um, – it's easy to talk about player of the game, MVP of the game. So let's go ahead and talk about it. But I'm going to give you a little leeway here, fellas. Okay? I love leeway. It love could leeway. it could just be one player. Okay. It could be two players. Uh-huh. It could be a position group. Because and if maybe you know anything about group. this podcast, we cheat a Whoa. lot in these categories. <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing called leeway that gets uh. stretched up in here. Yeah. All right, Shock. So let's start with you. Who you got as an MVP position, player, group, whatever it may be. I like that we have leeway and you say we have a group. Obviously, the low-hanging fruit that I know Arch probably was going to go in and take Ritter. <laughs> but uh, we're going to stay away from Ritter because that's the most obvious. Yeah. <laughs> and I think for me, I'm going to go with the offensive line. Ooh, and you're talking about giving up zero sacks. You're talking about giving Ritter time to get rid of the football. Run game was there when you needed it to be. And in a game where the physicality was a big part of the ball game, I thought he did a good job of using that up front. So anytime you protect your quarterback and you have a really good game like that, you got to get old line some love, man. Because yeah. obviously the quarterback plays well. You got a bunch of guys on the outside, receivers, tight ends. They all do well. Only one group really matters when it comes to that. So I think the old line played a pretty good ball game. You leave it up to the quarterbacks, right? The quarterbacks are the ones to yes, give sir. the offensive line some Gotta love. Get a big boy love. And in, in all honesty, though, when an offense is not playing well, that's a position group that's easy to criticize yeah. as well. That's where a lot of people want, especially when there's been pressure on the quarterback. Everybody wants to point fingers on the offensive line. But most players, most coaches will tell you that offense is not going to be successful if your offensive line is not working together and they had one of their best games of the season. Offensive line plays well. Quarterback plays well, as you talked about, because he was able to get the ball in the hands of the tight ends. And my Mm. MVP of this one is the tight end group, because I think a lot of us, you know, maybe in private conversations, maybe a little bit on this podcast, we're saying – Where's Kyle Pitts been lately? And, yes, he's been coming back from injury. And Kyle Pitts had a kind of a breakout performance. It's interesting, guys. I talked about it on our pregame show with Taylor about maybe this is the game that Kyle does end up having his breakout performance of the season. Kyle ends up with seven catches, 87 yards. But that group, Jonu Smith, six for 67. And Mm. then Michael Pruitt, one for 22. 14 Mm. catches, 176 yards, over half of Desmond Ritter's passing yards ended up going to the tight end group. And oddly enough, Jonu Smith has been one of the primary targets throughout the entire season. But when you get a guy like Kyle Pitts involved in the the passing game, you get the football in his hands, the catch radius that he has, the ability to just throw it up in his vicinity, chances are he's going to be able to make a catch. And he made a couple of tough catches in that game. One's in traffic, one's that he knew he was going to take a hit. He was able to secure him. I thought it was a big point in that game. And that's, and that's Janu as opposed to Janu, which you heard on <laughs> I the heard, broadcast. I heard that. Oh, yeah, that happened. Well, I heard it the, the week before, too, and I was a little uh, cringeworthy. Yeah. <laughs> Because I've been around the building for, you know, in this offseason ever since he was acquired, and I was like, 
I never heard anybody refer no, to him as Janu yeah. before. It's good child reporting. <laughs> Arch good reporting. MVP player performance group. Uh-oh. Yeah, okay, you guys camped out on the offensive side, and rightly so. It was fun to watch the quarterback play and all the weapons make plays. Offensive wrong line with provide that opportunity. Nothing, nothing, side, nothing I mean, wrong with that. That seemed like a, a little I'm shot. Gonna, I'm going to jump to the other side of the ball. A team that gave up, uh, the group that gave up was one touchdown and four field goals in the game and really came up big. Remember the Bijan Robinson fumble deep in your own territory. Gets the stop, forced the field goal. They get the opening drive, move it down. Third, second one, third one, stone them, force a field goal. So the defensive group, and namely the defensive backs, I want to give Jeff Akuda some love here. Jeff Akuda finally on the field, got a, me, uh, Man, the, a ton call. of play time in this mm-hmm. game, yeah. started at the corner spot. A guy that we thought was going to be the guy to, from the beginning, had the ankle sprain, was unable to play most of training camp, missed the first couple of games, back on the field. And Nico Collins came into this game with seven catches, 60, 168 yards, and two touchdowns the previous week, yep. and had been lighting it up. This yep. quarterback had been averaging about 300 yards a game. Didn't see that, and yep. they limited the opportunities. Tank Dell did was not a factor. In fact, ended up getting knocked out of the game. Let's hope he's going to be okay. But this passing game that we'd heard so much about, the plays down the field, and they still made, I think, five or six plays that were 15 yards plus. They came in with a game against Pittsburgh the previous week, 10 plays of 15 yards or more. This defense limited what they were able to do, and I would credit maybe the secondary in particular and go ahead and give Jeff Akuda, A.J. Terrell, and Mike Hughes, who came in because A.J. got a little banged up yeah. and really locked down the corner, too. So three former number ones played not number ones this weekend. How about Alford, too? A couple of nice pass breakups yep. in the yeah. game were TFL very timely, too, yeah. very timely. And you mentioned Akuda. There was a couple. I know one in particular. He brought the thunder on somebody, mm-hmm. uh, caught the ball in the flat. And a lot of times when you see corners make tackles, like they just make tackles. They don't necessarily make their presence felt, mm. if you know what I mean. But Okuda came up and stuck somebody on one play and I was I was pretty impressed by the physicality that he played with at that position so it's good to see a guy like him getting healthier and becoming a difference maker on this defense which many thought that he was going to be when he was signed in the offseason real quick before we move on to the next one can we all agree about the MVP moment of the game was Bijan Robinson I mean I don't want to lead you guys into a specific play yeah. but the, spe- the the play that we've seen all over social media the shovel pass that he catches sandwiches next Next to his hip, his back, his stomach, whatever it ends up being. Meanwhile, shakes somebody, yeah. right, with it just held right next to him and then finds his way into the end zone. Is it like week <laughs> after week, fellas, that we find that moment? It was like, what can he not do? Well, first off, I don't think the game is hard enough for Bijan. Obviously, that's why he's trying these different things in every single ball game. And you know, it seems like he has to catch it with one hand because the game is just not that hard to him. No, but it's fun to watch him every single week. And I just, I we get to do a, a, a Falcon show after the game, and I get a chance to hear some of the calls from 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 uh, from Archer West. And when this happens, before he even gets into the end zone, <laughs> as West is still kind of diagramming the play, you can hear Arch in the background laughing because <laughs> it's just almost like comical to watch it happen and then to see it every week. So it's it's fun to watch this guy every single week, and every time he touches it, you're like, okay, this guy, he, this dude got a chance to do it. But then when he does stuff like this, all you can do is laugh. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I have seen no-look passes. I've never seen a no-look catch <laughs> because his eyes aren't even on the ball. If you watch it in slow-mo, he cradles the ball and pins it against his left cheek Just and is right shaking a, a guy at the same time as he goes in the end zone. Ooh, let me see that shake one more time. You see that? That was in slow-mo. That was, yeah. it was slow-mo, right? <laughs> Imagine if I threw that full speed. Now, I might dislocate my shoulder. But <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, it was a fun moment. I, hey, a, a secondary to that. Let's give uh, the new burgeoning passer in in our organization some credit. Drake London on the reverse. Not only does he have the presence to throw a nice tight spiral to Janu Smith for a big gain, he he had a little pocket pocket presence. He made a guy miss. (laughs) Henry Toa Toa's uh, got him dead to rights up the Uh, field. He shakes him and gets out of the pocket and makes the throw. So we got to give Drake his due, too. I got one to add, too. And since you guys are just going to, you know, lay on the offensive side, I'm going to talk about the defensive side for a minute because, you know, give you guys you know, all that. But uh, there was a play right before halftime, and it is a batted pass by Grady Jarrett. Mm-hmm. And if he does not bat this pass, if he does not get the penetration and push this guy back and bat that ball down. You and I were talking Tank about Tank Dale is sitting in the middle of that Falcons defense, and he's going to score a touchdown. Wide open. And instead, you hold him to a field goal. 
They come back out. Obviously, they could have got the two-for-one with a big touchdown coming out. They could have felt really different about themselves after being right there on what is a three-, four-yard line. But an outstanding individual effort play by Grady Jarrett to push the pocket and then get his hands up because if not, Tank Dale walks into the end zone. It was the one moment in the broadcast I used, you shall not pass. <laughs> and it literally applied. Yeah. It was great. Uh, you know, one of the things I felt like coming into the game the defense had to do was somehow affect C.J. Stroud. Mm. And sometimes affecting him isn't always getting sacks. And that, to me, was a premier example of that happening with a wide-open receiver just walks an offensive line lineman back into the backfield, gets the pass deflection, and ends up with a huge stop. So, all right, so we talked about a number of different moments. Let's kind of dive into this matchup a little bit more. Arch, I want to come back to you. I mean, we always talk about keys to the game. We always talk about areas that need to improve from the previous week, but highlight a couple of the things that you felt like Atlanta did well in this matchup that ended up allowing them to kind of weather the storm a little bit. They got off to a good start, and then the field goals kind of started to eat into their lead, ended up overtaking their lead right before the halftime break, but then to make the run to come back and get the victory. Well, I think that uh, the number one thing is something Shock and I have been talking about for several weeks now is your slow starts. Now, you still got off to a three and out, but that very next series you got it going, and why did you get it going? We talked about it, Chuck. Uh, Success on first down. You started having some success. Well, it was throw the football, get some run game, and you got enough out of the run game. We didn't see as many no-yard gains or tackle behind the line of scrimmage. Now, we still saw some of them. We're going to have to eliminate that. But there was more three-yard plays, four-yard plays. Now, as a play caller, uh, if I'm Arthur Smith, I've got a lot more stuff I can get to. I can get to the play where I'm going to give Drake the ball and he throws the football or some of, some of the screen plays or some of the, the variance plays. They ran 74 plays in this game, but which I think is the high for the year. And that gives you a lot more variety. I thought that the ability that in itself, being able to run more plays, allowed you – to have the tight ends have all the grabs yep. they had. Yep. Drake gets six grabs himself and climbs the ladder and makes a circus catch, uh, makes the throw we talked about. So just the ability to be good on first down or better, I shouldn't say good, better on first down, translated to your third down conversion scenario where we're at 50% on third downs. And I think that that's something that I thought you need to accentuate. And I think that's the reason why Ritter got into a rhythm. He had more opportunities. I don't think you want to live on 37 attempts every week yeah. for the quarterback. I yeah. think you'd, but 37 pass plays, 36 run plays, pretty good balance. Pretty good balance. Um, DJ, I want to come to you because, you know, it's we've been, been talking so much about Ritter and his development. Did he take all your stuff? <laughs> oh, my God. Unbelievable. I mean, the balance is. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. so here's the good thing. We so share gonna, a brain. You I'm going to set you up with a scenario and yeah. allow you to gather your thoughts since no, Arch I'm just good. took all of your stuff. No, 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 no. You take all of um, it. Yeah, we've talked so much about, about Desmond Ritter and his development. Right. Okay, you guys have been here before. You've been there at Georgia. You've been there as a backup in the NFL as far as learning and taking lessons from previous weeks. Put yourself in Desmond Ritter's shoes and think about his development as a quarterback. Success at home, struggled on the road, still a young quarterback in mm-hmm. the grand scheme of things, and how you saw some of those things play out on Sunday against Houston that attributed to his success. I think first off, where he has already, I don't want to say grown, but I think the first thing that he understood was I have to go back and I have to watch this tape and realize where I wasn't as efficient. And I heard before they got back here to Atlanta, he had already watched the game twice on mm-hmm. the plane. And that tells you right there that as bad as it was, he didn't want to put that to the side and say, all right, I don't even want to watch that film. He watched it two times to understand, okay, this is how I can get better. And I thought his he was very concise. I thought the ball was out of his hands. I thought he knew exactly where he wanted to go to football. But more than that, I thought he trusted his receivers for – I think the last couple of weeks, you know, we've talked about, okay, there's times where he's eyed people down or there's times where uh, he he didn't trust his guy to come out of it and he waited a little bit longer than he probably needed to. There was one particular play that sticks out of my mind so clearly. I mean, there was a couple of throws to Kyle where, you know, he lays it into the hole on these corner routes. He anticipated. Uh, you got Matt Collins running a deep over route, and the guy has his back to him, and he throws it anyway and gives it on his back back shoulder. But the one that really sticks out the most is they go two by two, and you got Kyle and Drake in a, in a like a little stack formation, and he's got a linebacker right in the middle. And the first thing he does is takes his eyes left. And it keeps that linebacker right in the middle and even moves him just slightly. And he comes back and hits Kyle on this slant. 
that tells you exactly what you need to know about Drake from one week to another is he understands how to use his eyes better, but then he also knows where his guys are going to be. And I thought that was paramount for him in his ball game, being able to get that football out of his hands, but also use his eyes yeah. and trust his guys around him to be where they're supposed to be on a particular routes. You know, it, there's so much that goes into playing the quarterback position mm-hmm. that I, I don't think that the, the the average fan or normal fan or even has, a, has an understanding. I'm not saying that fans are stupid or anything like that, but to think the things that he has to learn. This is ninth day on the job, okay? And mm-hmm. everybody wants to talk about, well, he's been practicing all that kind of stuff. The job is when you go play the games. Yeah. The practice is where you're trying to hone your skills as best you can, but you can't assimilate a game. So your test is game day. This was his ninth test. So to think this kid isn't going to continue to grow with all the success he had in college is being a little bit naive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, he's he's done that. He, he's taken each step. A couple of things, for instance, his ability to use hard count in the game. He pulled Great point. He pulled him off four, mm-hmm. what, three, four times. Four times yeah. yep. The one that sticks out to me is he hard counts and holds the count because Houston's coming with pressure off his left side, but they didn't declare it. They did a really good job of muddying the water. Safety had not moved over to take the slot or at least mirror the slot. And and you're going to bring slot pressure right here. So he hard counts and he delays and he holds the count. Now that's hard on the offensive line to give the line credit for sitting in there and waiting. But all of a sudden, Houston got antsy. He said, wait a minute, he's going to snap the ball and I'm going to be out of position. So they declared because they wanted to bring the slot defender through the B gap. They wanted to split those two offensive linemen. He held it long enough for his team to recognize it. And Kyle Pitts, who's in the slot, is running the route right there. Deep Kyle knew to idle down in the hole because it was – that's the kind of stuff, the growth you're looking yep. for. Don't just look for the throws and where they go. It's the growth of him at the line of scrimmage. Dummy calls, changing the play, flipping formation. You know, all the kind of things that go into a quarterback play, you're continuing to see this dude grow. And I thought this was a major step for him from some of the little ancillary pieces that people might, might not give him credit for. You know, it's interesting. You guys can probably back this up, but, you know, Matt Schaub was a good buddy of mine and had some conversation with him over the years. And and I think, again, the average fan might say, especially with an offense that's given up some sacks, say when you say pressure, all of a sudden they're like, oh, goodness, here we go again. But the quarterbacks that are feeling it the most and that are ready to t- attack – They want the pressure Mm -hmm. because they know they've got one-on-one matchups and they've got a lot of open field. Mm. So those are the areas, too. You talk about evolution of Desmond Ritter. As he starts to get more comfortable and he uses snap count to his advantage to help the defense declare what they're going to do, and then he gets them kind of – he, he understands where they're going to go, and now it's like bring the pressure Let's go. because now I know i got big plays coming. Yeah. I've got a man-to-man matchup on a, on a slant route, or i got a man-to-man on the outside. I can throw it up to one of my big receivers. A lot of quarterbacks will tell you, bring it. <laughs> bring the cover one, the cover zero, and the pressure because now is our opportunity to get some explosive plays. One thing I wanted to ask you guys about, time of possession. Atlanta ended up having the ball for 35 minutes, 32 seconds, Houston 24-28. I call a lot of college games, and I always tell people that time of possession might be one of the most overrated statistics, especially in the age of of hurry-up offenses where teams just go boom, boom, boom down the field. Right, 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 right. Arch, do you think it's important for Atlanta to possess the football with their style of offense and then facing a Houston team that basically showed that their best chance successful for successful offense was through the air? Yeah, I think there's there's some validity to the stat. I think that how do you get to the stat? I think when you begin to look and you break down the other numbers and how they correlate to the time of possession, that's where you realize it's a winning formula. You limited uh, Houston to three for 13 in conversion situations, or four for 13, four 13 in conversion yeah. situations. That's losing football. Yep. Now, as long as you're not giving up explosives, which they didn't. I said I think they gave up six or seven plays of 15 yards or more. That was well under what uh, Houston had done in their last two wins. Then all of a sudden that equates to, okay, we've got the ball more. I think we ran 74 plays to their 55 plays. If you're not giving up explosives and they're not converting on third down, now all of a sudden – that formula of possessing the football means you're shortening the game and they just don't have enough opportunities. And here's the other part to it, and we saw it in the ball game. They're not giving up as many explosive, and they ran for 64 yards in the game. A lot of that came at the end of the ball game. Yeah. Average 2.8 yards a rush. So you yep. look up and you're not getting the explosive you're used to getting. You're not running the football like you're used to. 
So now there was two or three chances in the ball game where you can see C.J. Stroud starting to feel like, okay, I need to make a play. And he forced the ball a couple times. Mm-hmm. And that's what a good defense does. That's what when an offense possesses the football and you look up and you're down, like, okay, we got to find a way to move the football and push it down the field. And when those two components are not coming together – Time possession is a really good thing. It's interesting, too, when you look at the young quarterback. How do you attack young quarterbacks? And we've seen a couple, right? We saw some a different philosophy potentially against Bryce Young than we saw this weekend against C.J. Stroud. But Atlanta played a lot more coverage in this game than they'd played in the four previous games. Not as much pressure package mm-hmm. situations. It was more four-man rush. In fact, you even saw a bunch of three-man pass rush drop eight into coverage to make the young kid find guys open. Yeah. And ultimately, he got frustrated and started dumping the ball off underneath. And that was what equated to a lot of the la- the, the lack of third down conversion. So I thought Ryan Nielsen did a really good job with his game plan to kind of frustrate a quarterback who had seen something on tape. Then all of a sudden, this weekend, he saw something completely different. Yep, yep. So defensively, we've talked a lot of offense. Just wanted to make sure – uh, Shock just talked about it. 23 carries for just 64 yards rushing against the Atlanta defense. Arch, you mentioned that Nico Collins, he was averaging 107 <laughs> receiving yards a game coming yeah. into this one, held for three for 39. Mm. So Atlanta obviously knowing where the biggest threat was for the Texans wide receiver group and limited him. Then, of course, C.J. Stroud, he was averaging over 300 yards passing through the f- first four games, held the 249 yards passing in this one. Real quick, I want to finish up the conversation on Desmond Ritter. DJ, let me come to you here. It's there was a lot of discussion I saw on social media about Desmond Ritter's quiets the critics. Okay, and one thing that we all know, he knows, Arthur Smith knows. I saw him even talk about it in his post game press conference. Was the NFL is about what do you do for me lately? No doubt, right? No doubt. So yes, he quieted his critics. He got that fourth quarter drive to win a football game, which kind of makes everybody it's a little sigh of relief, right? It's something that he can kind of check off his list, but. But the job is not done, mm-hmm. right? It's like you can enjoy it for one night and then you got to go back to work because now the standard has been set. What does he need to do to be able to build on top of this performance? I think the greatest thing is he has a guy that believes in him and Arthur Smith. I go back two weeks ago after the game versus the Jaguars. The first thing he said was, we believe in this guy. Yeah, he's a young guy. And guess what? You're going to have these days. You're going to have these nights. But it's how are you going to respond? And he responded this week. And I think the best, biggest thing he can do is consistently do the things that he did in this past ball game, which is get the ball out of his hands. Don't turn it over. Make good decisions like Arch talked about at the line of scrimmage. Getting this team into winnable situations, I think, is what will make him become a better player and more consistent player. Let's just think about, the, the, the I think, the two biggest moments in the ball game, the last two drives where he goes down, and he goes 11 for 11 on those last two drives, 18 to 21 in the second half to help his team win the ball game. And you're talking about getting the ball with, you know, a minute plus and three timeouts, and he never flinched. Yeah. And that's the thing you like about your quarterback. In those moments, he played his biggest football. In those moments, he didn't try to force the issue knowing we need to go score. In both situations, the Falcons were down, and he had to go make plays. And I thought, you know, 10, 11 guys caught a pass. The distribution, he's seeing the field. He's seeing guys. He's seeing defenders. Yeah. And I think ultimately – that will be winning football. And we, as a quarterback, anytime you have confidence like that, it feels good. I think that's – we talked about last week coming in was C.J. Stroud was a guy who coming in had just won his last two ball games, yep. hadn't thrown an interception. He's confident. He feels good about the way he plays. I think this is a similar situation for Desmond Ritter walking into next week as, hey, I know what it looks like when I put it all together. Yep. I know what it looks like when I stay within this offense – and I can make plays and win ball games for my team as well. We talked about moments, and uh, we talked about Bijan Robinson. We talked a little bit about Drake in the reverse pass. I wanted to arch get your thoughts on <laughs> because I mentioned it in the pregame show. We, we talked about this off air. How is the offense doing? Are there any issues? And it, and and I mentioned sometimes it's not about scheme, mechanics, technique. It's about a guy going out and making a play. You just need players to go make some plays. And Drake London on the final drive went and made a play. How big did you think that one was for them to come away with the victory? Not just the fact that it made a play for them to get in scoring territory, but for one of the 
the best players that we have on this team to go up over the defense, make a play, and it just got everybody energized. The entire stadium went crazy. I think it was uh, the emotion Drake shows as he goes up the ladder and makes that catch. By the way, perfect placement of the football. Mm -hmm. You've got a guy that's it's a 50-50 monster. When he came in the league, they talked about Drake not running by people. They said, hey, you throw this ball in the area and he's going to go get it. And that's kind of all he's done. And this was the epitome of that, him climbing the ladder and making that grab. And then his helmet gets ripped off. And then the emotion you saw from him, I thought there was a lot of reasons why the emotion. Obviously, a big moment in the game, gave your team an opportunity to put points on the board. But there, I'm sure there was some frustration that had built over the last yeah. two weeks about their inability to move the football and put points on the board and, and just be explosive and do things. And, and you mentioned 11 different guys caught passes. You got guys, you know, six, seven grabs from three or four different guys. And, and so Drake is supposed to be a focal point of that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought his emotion probably encapsulated everybody yeah. on the team on the offensive side of the football. But, ah, here we are. <laughs> We're here. We no burst doubt. on the scene. Um, it meant a big – it was a great It was a great deal. And just to double down – on Ritter and 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 what that moment means, I think it means a lot to his teammates because they see what it can look like. I think Dez always kind of knew inside himself that he could make some of those plays, and I thought he carried over the second half of the Jacksonville game yeah. into this game. He threw the ball accurately, was making shot, taking shots down the field. The ball was coming out on time, but it made the guys around him say, "This is what it's supposed to look like. I know, and I know what I can do, but I need to help you guys." and you and I both know as a quarterback, one of our number one jobs is to make the guys around you feel pretty comfortable with yeah. the old line of the receivers. And I thought he did a great job of doing that this weekend. So commanders at two and three are next on the docket. Arch, I come right back to you. How does Atlanta use this confidence, the success that they had against Houston, and what type of challenges do the commanders present for that to continue? Yeah, this is a different animal you're going to play this weekend. Now, this is a team that can get after the passer, and they also haven't protected the passer very well. If you go look at the numbers, Sam hell has been dropped, I think, 29, 29 times, times in the first five games of the season. Well, guess what? The dudes on the other side, whether it's Sweat or Payne or Allen or Chase Young, that's the front four. Those guys can come get you now. This is a, a much better defense, I would say man-to-man, -man, a better defense. Now, the numbers might not reflect that, but from a personnel standpoint, mm -hmm. this is going to be a very difficult challenge to protect against the front four. Mm -hmm. And this is an offensive line that's been challenged a little bit yep. in the first five games of the yep. season. So that's where, to me, the challenge stands. And, and if you think this is a fourth round draft pick coming in. We've got a third round draft pick. These are two guys that are starting to come into their own. We saw what Ritter can do. Anybody that watched the Bear game and watched Hal throw the football, this <laughs> dude can throw it everywhere. Mm -hmm. He had 37 completions in the game. They lost the game, but the dude can throw it now. So you better get after him. So line of scrimmage, DJ, going to be big in this one protecting against some really good, as Arch mentioned, individual players for the commanders. But also, maybe it's a lick your lick if you play on the defensive line for Atlanta. <laughs> say, we're going to get after the quarterback this yeah. week. I hope so. Yeah, I mean, you definitely hope so. I mean, that's one of the things that obviously everybody wants to see is get sacks. You want to get the quarterback on the ground. And – how coming to this game, obviously with the sacks, he's got six interceptions too. So that tells you he's been under duress, but he also would throw it to you a little bit. But a very confident kid like Archer talked about. You go back to a couple weeks ago when they played Philly. Had Philly on the rope, should have probably won that ball game. He has to go down and get his team in position to go win the ball game. He goes down, gets the touchdown, and also gets a two-point conversion. The kid's got some moxie coming in here. So don't think because he's been sacked 29 times, he won't stand in there and fire the rock. So it's going to be a, a great challenge, but I think this is what you want. This is why you want to you know, play against a team like this because they're going to bring their best as well as you will. You've heard a couple of the words that we've talked about a lot in this podcast. Confidence, moxie. Sometimes it all ain't all about the X's and O's. It's how you feel and how confident you are coming into the game. All right, so Atlanta with the victory over the Houston Texans. They will try to parlay in, in, that into two in a row against the Washington two Commanders a... this Sunday. That has yeah, been yeah. the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Huh? You know, we couldn't get through a podcast oh, without right. some type of Cyclone, dog Cyclone, talk. Cyclone, Cyclone, Cyclone. Yeah. Cyclone. You guys didn't win the big bad. We'll bad job. No, <laughs> so anyway, we will uh, send you out on that note. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. See you next time.